Welcome to Calming the Chaos Podcast, where we help you find peace in a chaotic world. I'm your host, Tracy Canella, licensed mental health counselor. Calming the Chaos provides self-help resources for people in crisis. It's not a substitute for counseling or psychotherapy. Thanks for tuning in. And now, let the chaos begin. Eating Disorders Awareness Week has officially ended because today is March 4th, 2024. However, I would like us all to keep eating disorders in the forefront of your mind and also in the back of your mind as you look at people and yourself in this world today. So here's what we're going to do. I have a couple of clips to share for you. They're really short and I'm going to let them play through and I am going to tell you some of my reactions to them because they have a think a lot of information to offer you in terms of why people come down with eating disorders in the first place and about males with eating disorders. So we're going to go ahead and let the clips play and then I will do some commentary afterwards. So let's go. You know, it's interesting, an eating disorder never travels alone. Usually there, there are other issues that are going on simultaneously. And the eating disorder, in a way, acts as a coping mechanism to manage that. So when I used to get this question in clinical assessment all the time, people would say, you know, why, Jen? Why am I struggling with this? Or why is my son or daughter or my wife dealing with this? And it's never just one thing. You know, the best way that I can explain it is to sort of conceptualize it like a puzzle. And there are five pieces to the puzzle of why. First and foremost, we know through research that most people who struggle with an eating disorder have either struggled with anxiety in some fashion and or depression long before the eating disorder comes into town. And so that's one risk factor. Secondly, certain personality traits and a certain temperament can put people at risk, namely, you know, being very sensitive to change or conflict, having a difficult time, you know, when it comes to dealing with, you know, what decisions can, being decisive in their lives, you know, what do I want to do? What, what do I want to do with my life? Sometimes can feel a little overwhelming. And finally, you know, being very driven, sometimes perfectionistic or people pleasing, all of those things predate the onset of the eating disorder. So that's sort of the wiring, that's sort of the stuff that's going on beneath the surface. And the other three pieces of the puzzle really culture. I mean, we live in a very toxic culture when it comes to body image and relationship with exercise and with food. And so it's, it's you know, unfortunate that in this culture, we sort of set the stage for the development of an eating disorder. And the other two, you know, are relationships. You know, if we were sitting here several years ago, you know, unfortunately in, in this field, we used to blame family members for you know, your mom or dad is the reason why the child is struggling with an eating disorder. And we now know that there may be situations where the family dynamics has played a role, but we also know that people with eating disorders can come from extremely loving homes. And so it's really about understanding how that person has managed relationships in their life in terms of conflict, in terms of change, in terms of honesty and vulnerability. And then the final piece is trauma or loss. Now, not every person that struggles with an eating disorder has had some major trauma in their life. Some certainly have, but I always think of trauma as it doesn't have to be you know, this huge event. It doesn't have to be major physical or emotional trauma. It can be a collection of seemingly insignificant or common things such as moving or you know, having a conflict with a friend, not being picked for a particular sports team that over time, if you have a sensitive personality and and temperament, it rattles you a little bit more. So, you know, again, biology, temperament or personality traits, culture, trauma, and relationship dynamics. So when we're looking at, you know, the whole person and how to treat them, it's always really important for us to get a thorough understanding of each piece of that puzzle and how it applies to that particular patient so we can have a better chance at helping them. So that was Jennifer Lombardi, and she is with the Eating Recovery Center of California. I have a close tie to Eating Recovery Center of Washington and Denver. I visited both locations and I refer my clients there uh, pretty often when they need a higher level of care than what I can offer them in my counseling office. So the first thing that Jennifer said about 
why people struggle with eating disorders is that there is pre-existing anxiety and depression. Well, you know, there's a lot of people who come into my practice with pre-existing anxiety and depression, and some of them don't develop an eating disorder. Some of them do, and some of them don't. When you're looking at anxiety and depression, you're either looking at like, I'm anxious about something and because I'm so overwhelmed by that anxiety, I get depressed or I am so depressed and I'm not getting anything done so that I get anxious about it. So that's a really good way to understand how anxiety and depression can just exist together in those two types of ways. And the second thing that Jennifer mentions about how you might develop an eating disorder is these biological traits that you might have. If you're a sensitive person, or if you're a perfectionistic, if you're a person who is sensitive to criticism, if you're a high achiever, if uh, you know, you've got these personality traits that are really sensitive to certain kind of criticisms, you may be more prone to developing an eating disorder. I don't think she mentions the genetic and biological aspects as much as I hope that she would, but there's a huge genetic tie. I like to call it biopsychosocial and biopsychosocial meaning that we have our biology that we're born with. We have our psychology, which is the way that we think about the world. And then we have our social, which is the people in our world and the environments and how we react to it. It all comes into one thing. Marsha Linehan talks about this in Dialectical Behavior Therapy. If you'd like more information about Dialectical Behavior Therapy, let me know. But she talks about that and I'd like to be able to just engulf Jennifer's points two, three, and four in that, in that we've got biology, we've got psychology, and we've got society. And she does mention this part about parents and about how we used to blame parents. I actually don't remember that being true, but maybe she's been in the field a lot longer than I have, but I've never blamed parents. I don't think any parent wants their child to have an eating disorder, and I don't think any child wants an eating disorder, same as adults and spouses or environments. You just can't blame environments. We, what we have to do is we have to teach coping skills to people who struggle with managing their environments. And that I believe is the ticket out, is understanding that there is an environment out there that is sometimes really super painful. How you deal with it though is your choice. And so it really is not about blame, but it's about understanding the context. So then Jennifer mentions trauma. And I want to talk a little bit about that because that's something that we typically will treat last. We'll want to do some of the treatment about behaviors and we'll want to have our thinking, check the facts, modified and all that other stuff that we do in psychology. And then we want to treat the trauma. Uh, trauma can, again, like she said, come in big trauma, like I like to say big T trauma, as in you are in a country that is in a war, or your house was robbed, or there is some sort of a violent crime committed against you, and or little T traumas, which is you're being teased, or you're being bullied, or you don't make the soccer team or you're, um, you have some things that are happening to you socially that are causing you a trauma or within the family as well. So all of these little T's can add up to this death by a thousand paper cuts sort of scenario that you can find yourself in. And an eating disorder can come of that. And how? Because in some way, shape or form, an eating disorder can be helpful. And I always like to tell my clients that is that, this did not happen because it was dumb. It happened because your mind figured out a way to cope with some really painful stuff. And we can do that in a different types of ways. And so when we think about eating disorders and how and why we develop them, I always like to say that no two people are going to have the same ways that they developed an eating disorder. No people are going to have the same struggle. No two people are going to have the same recovery. So it's all different. And so that's why it's really important for therapists not to use a cookie cutter approach in treating them because they just don't know why and how 
and what this person's thinking is and what the trauma background is. So now we have another video that we're going to watch and it's Freddie Flintoff. And I actually had never heard of him before I wanted to do some research for Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And so Freddie Flintoff is a man who is a professional or was a professional a cricket player in England. And uh, now he's turned a uh, media person and he is talking openly about his bulimia. So so let's look at this video of Freddie Flintoff and we'll see you on the other side and I'll tell you what I think. This is, this, this is such a hard thing to define or even admit. Throughout my career, I've lived with an eating disorder called bulimia. And despite being in the public eye, for years I've managed to keep it hidden. I still find it hard to say bulimia. I usually dance around it and say I've been sick. I've done it. I've done it this year. It's not right, is it? I know it's not right, but I can't say for certain that this is going to stop. Or when it'll happen again. I, I, I don't know. Old Trafford, my home ground, where I played since I was nine. This is the chance as a Lancastrian to walk out for England in front of your home crowd, family, friends, people who'd seen you. I was excited. But England's preparations have been overshadowed by speculation about the fitness of Andrew Flintoff. That's when I started, I reckon, that's when I, I became a word that I put this weight on. The headline writers have been cruel to Andrew Flintoff, claiming his weight has affected his form. Got nailed in the press as a 20 year old, I hammered for being fat. And then after that, I felt like everyone was watching me. I became known as a fat cricketer, really. That was horrible. That's when I started doing it. Apart from my own experience, I know nothing about it. And part of me doesn't wanna know. Because I've, I've been living with this and gone through it for a long time, but I'm 42, four kids. I think I should, I think I should find out. Oh, hello mate. Hello mate, Fred. Hello mate, nice Thanks to meet you. so much for having us. No problem. Nice to see you. Thank you. I've been dealing with the same cycle for years. I'd sit on the train going into work and you think that everyone is looking at you. Yeah. You fat bastard kind of thing. It's just no way to go through life. I, I had a similar thing. I got a kick in the press for being fat. And after that, I thought everyone was looking at me. Mm -hmm. When I go shopping, everyone was looking. Nobody was. The other thing is as well, I don't know if it's for being a bloke. You feel that you should just be able to stop it. But yeah. You, it you, sounds you, weird you to say, though. but there's an extra like mm -hmm. little bit of shame on top of it. Women seek help and they're encouraged to do that, but men are very much supposed to be able to cope. But of course, men, do suffer from this and yeah. there's lots of men out there that are struggling and unfortunately it stigmatizes more of a, a female illness don't fall into the trap that i did of thinking that it's not serious enough or i'm not doing it often enough to warrant doing it i, I don't know if it's not i think i don't think it's serious enough and because it is but whether i'm, I'm getting all defensive i've crossed my arms <laughs> um i didn't expect to have a conversation with you and have so many things hit on to me and then me learn off you. I didn't expect that. Well, thanks for saying that, you know. It's yeah. Anything that... If, if I... If someone like me... I'm well enough, yeah. I don't know why. I'm well <laughs> enough. I never cry. I'm well enough. Never do. Well, that might be part of the reason, Freddie is that you never do cry. And so eating disorders are very much about emotions or about suppressing emotions or controlling emotions or coping with emotions using food or using it in some sort of way. So Freddie says he has had bulimia. He's 42 and he's been dealing with, with it since he was 20 years old. So that's, you know, do the math, right? 22 years, most of his life has been spent dealing with bulimia. He's got four kids, he's married, 
And by that account, it looks like he's still struggling with it and doesn't really want to know a whole lot about it. But then he goes to seek some sort of group treatment, or at least for purposes of this BBC documentary, felt that it was something that he needed to look at. And I just say, he is a great noticer. He notices that it's a problem. He also notices himself getting defensive and he notices himself getting tearful. So noticing is the very first thing that you need to do in order to change something. And so he's doing that and I hope that he's going to change. So men, yes, they do have eating disorders. And I thought I'd put that clip in there because I don't know that a lot of attention is paid to this. Men definitely have different sort of dynamics going on socially, biologically, psychologically than uh, women. And then there are people who are non-binary as well who are affected by their thinking. But for purposes of this discussion, uh, this is a man and he has said, being a professional and in the limelight, being a cricket player, he was started to get a lot of harassment from the press about being overweight, about his body shape, size, form, performance. And then what he did was he thought, oh no, I'm fat. He actually agreed with the press and he thought it was a bad thing. And so he took action upon it. And that's when he started doing his behaviors. Now, he doesn't go into detail about what his undoing behavior is, whether it's vomiting, whether it's laxative use, or whether it's over-exercising, or if he's using long periods of time of fasting as well to um, do the undoing of the calories that he's eaten. But he does admit that he has a problem. So about 30% of all people who struggle with eating disorders are male, and they do have their struggles. So if you're a male and you're listening to this, please don't ignore the messages here. And I would suggest that you check out the full BBC documentary of a Freddie here. And I'll go ahead and put his name up on here. Uh, it's a Freddie Flintoff and he's a former pro cricketer turned some sort of social media guy. And apparently still struggles with bulimia. I hope he gets the help he needs and or has gotten it. I hope you found this really helpful. If you want to listen to the, uh, the full videos, I've actually linked them below and you can go ahead and do that. And I really hope that you will carry the message from these two people and from me into your lives. Just be vigilant about yourself and your neighbors. And I'll put some more links that are helpful in the show notes that if you think that you might have an eating disorder or somebody that you care about, that you can access some information and help. Thanks for joining me on Calming the Chaos today and you take good care. Thanks for listening to Calming the Chaos podcast. If you found this podcast interesting or helpful, please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also go to www.calmingthechaospodcast.com to listen to all Calming the Chaos podcast episodes. I look forward to sharing my next podcast episode with you. In the meantime, take care. Howl at the moon or something like that.